Yeah, so always so great to worship together as a church. I'm excited to share this message with you today. Um, In my first sermon, I had the somewhat daunting task of tackling the verses directly leading up to the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. If you remember, that was the story of Nicodemus and being born again, John 3, 1 to 15. I'm not sure whether this is an easier task today, but today we're going to be going and taking a little detour from the Gospel of John and popping over to the book of Revelation. Now, when we think about the book of Revelation, it can sometimes seem daunting. It can seem a bit scary, right? Whether it is the subject matter itself or hoping we'll land on the correct interpretation, there are a lot of different opinions on Revelation, and so we kind of try to avoid it. It, It's written for us through the Apostle John. We also find that it doesn't come in chronological order, so it can be a little bit disorienting. It's less about where we are in time and more about what does John tell us next, similar to what you might see in a movie that does callbacks and points forward. Revelation, it can almost be thought of as a cinematic journey of what we're shown scene by scene revealing to us. It's apocalyptic literature, so there are a lot of symbols and imagery, like a cosmic movie of grand proportions. So maybe think... Lord of the Rings, but magnified to some exponent. The very nature of the genre and themes can make it hard to get our arms and our minds around it, but I want to encourage us that from studying Revelation, I found it to be extremely encouraging and comforting to the believer. It's certainly a warning for those who need to repent and put their faith in Jesus, however. So bear that in mind, if you are a believer, this book is meant to comfort you and bless you until the Lord returns. So let's not avoid the book of Revelation. The good news about our section today is I think the message is actually quite clear. It's very challenging, but clear. Now we all know, uh, back in the book of John, I don't think we have our banner here today, which makes sense, but we had a very clear purpose statement for the book of John, right? We could even boil it down to one word believe. We saw that in John 20, 31, but these are written, this is the the miracles, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So you get a very clear purpose statement in the Gospel of John, a direct kind of verse that gives that to us. We don't quite get the same thing for Revelation. So Um, you can't just go to one verse and say, here is the purpose of the book. But I do have a purpose statement, and this has been put together with some, um, some help. So here I'll read this to you. Blessed are those who remain steadfast and proclaim the testimony of the Lord because our conquering king has final victory and will dwell again with his people. If I were actually to boil it down to a single word like we have believe, I might say conquer. You will see conquer quite a bit today. Now, today we're going to be going to look at the Ephesian church in Revelations 2, 1 to 7. Before we turn to that passage, I want to provide a little bit of surrounding context. The letter to the church at Ephesus is the first of seven letters that Jesus commands John to write down to the seven churches in Asia Minor. This is what is modern-day Turkey. John wrote these down while exiled on the island of Patmos. I've got a slide here, and this kind of shows you a map of, of this. So you've got the island of Patmos, you can see towards the bottom, and then the seven churches. The churches were on a popular postal route and trade route, and the letters were actually written in the clockwise order. So if you look through Revelation 2 and 3, you'll see it goes Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, etc., So John is on the island of Patmos, and he receives a vision that he's commanded to write down, and that forms the book of Revelation for us. So John gives us this account in Revelation 1, 9 to 11. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, that patient endurance will be key today, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day 
And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So he's written to all seven churches, and now we're going to kind of zoom the lens in on the letter to the church at Ephesus. We're going to see what Jesus is saying to the church at Ephesus and what that means for us. So please follow along in your Bibles, and then I'll give us a little bit of cultural context, and we'll get into our first point. As always, if you do not have a Bible, there's lots of new faces here today I'm seeing, pop up your hand, and we can certainly bring one to you. I know Quinton said last week that he got a new box of Bibles because we've been going through them, which is fantastic. If you do not have a Bible, and we hand that to you, that's obviously yours to take home. We want the Word of God available and in your home. So, turn with me to Revelation 2, 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who hold the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet, this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God." Now, we always uh, obviously need God's help to illuminate this text to our hearts, as we always do. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for sending us um, Jesus to be our only hope in life and death, to be the head of the big C church and the head of our church here, our growing church, Redemption Calgary South. We thank you, Jesus, that you walk as we saw in the text, present tense with our church. We pray that you will reveal to us your character, the love that we should have, the cost of following you, and the joyful reward for those who endure. Amen. Now, we are focusing on one particular letter, the first letter, but if you were to go ahead and read all seven letters, you would notice that there are some similarities in terms of structure. It's always kind of useful for us to notice. So the, all these letters are Revelation 2 and 3. So just in those two chapters, you've got all seven letters. And you'll see a similar structure here. Angelo has put it up here. You'll see a characteristic of Christ that's drawn at the beginning of the letter. You'll see a commendation where relevant. You'll see a criticism and correction where relevant. And then you'll see a challenge and a promise. There is a little bit of variance. For example, Smyrna and Philadelphia don't receive a criticism. Laodicea uh, wasn't commended. But that is the general structure. So with that in mind, let's turn to verse 1 and pick up our section here in chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So the stars are representative of the church. This could be an angel. This could be a pastor. Um, there's a few interpretations on that. The lampstands represent the church itself. He holds the seven stars. He walks among the lampstands. So I found this encouraging. Jesus is here. He is omnipresent. He is at work. He is not an absentee landlord. Now let's move into verse 2 and 3, and we're going to see the commendation that the Ephesian church is going to um, receive 
And that's going to bring us uh, up to our first point. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. This was a church that patiently endured. And that brings us to our first point, our commendation, endure with patience. You actually see in the seven letters that patient endurance four times, and two of those are in the first letter. So we see a bit of repetition. It's always good to kind of pay attention to that. The patient endurance was necessary for the Ephesian church because they were under intense persecution, persecution that had spanned three decades. Ephesus was an important port city with lots of trade and wealth. It was well known as a city that worshipped Artemis, a Greek goddess, and much of the local economy and social life was centered on this worship. Now, it's one thing for Jews to live in the city, have their synagogues, and raise their, their kids to worship Yahweh. That's not bothering anybody. But suddenly, there's a Christian church in Ephesus, and they're not keeping to themselves. They're spreading the gospel. They're not buying idols to worship anymore. They're doing business ethically. Maybe they used to give or take bribes, and they won't anymore. But they aren't going, to, and maybe they aren't going to social gatherings where immoral practices are happening. The presence of the church was disruptive to the way of life in Ephesus. And as a result, there was persecution. It, this persecution is pretty extreme. I would contend it's more than what we face here in Canada. We are talking about Christians who are being imprisoned, thrown to wild animals as entertainment, being lit on fire. This kind of persecution was serious and imminent. Christians were social outcasts, facing economic hardship, physical threat, and even death. Now, I want to underline that although they are facing intense persecution, God was not absent. As we see in verse 1, he walks present tense with the churches. God was also not silent. He's speaking powerfully through this letter and through the apocalyptic visions in Revelation to ensure that the believers knew he was in control and would conquer in the end. That being said, this was not an easy place to patiently endure and to bear for my name's sake, as we see in verse 3. The Ephesian church would have been maligned and slandered, boycotted and abused, been objects of physical violence, social ostracism, and economic repression. They were not fair-weather fans of Christ, and the Lord took note of their dedication. The Ephesian church also didn't tolerate false apostles or teachers. You see that in verse 2. You cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. What do we think those tests would have looked like if we put our little doctrinal hats on and we wanted to test those who were apostles and see that what they were saying was true? I don't have a slide for this, but these are just some general notes that probably would have pertained also to this church. What do you believe about the person and work of Christ? If you're testing a potentially false group of apostles, what is the gospel? How are people born again? Do you believe a holy life should complement our confession of faith? There was a lot of, you know, you're believing in this, but you're kind of not living that way. So we certainly believe a holy life should complement our confession of faith. And do you teach anything contrary or in addition to the word of God and the witness of the 12 apostles? So those have been kind of the sort of things they would have been testing for to see if they were um, true. We see a similar warning down in 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, standing firm was the far more difficult task. It would have been easier to compromise and enjoy the benefits of Ephesus. It was a port city, a trade city, on a major trade route, a place of wealth and commerce and amenities, the temptation would be to conform, to find peace, kind of enjoy prosperity. I think maybe we might do that a bit in our culture, right? Get a little too comfortable 
with being Canadian. But they patiently endured against trial, bore suffering for the name of Jesus, and tested those who were false and rebuked them. Jesus took notice of this faithfulness, and we should remember that he sees our works and sees our endurance as well. So, we should remain um, enduring with patience, as our first commendation there says. I think about our church and our country, this is a free place, right? We have the freedom of worship with no fear of being fed to wild animals or lit on fire. The persecution we may experience in our lifetime is certainly not zero, and I would say it's getting worse, right? But it's not on this order of magnitude. And yet we have the same task, don't we? Remain steadfast. Patient endurance is critical to overcoming trials and tribulations, but it's also critical for long, dry stretches of the race with nothing in sight. The Ephesian church was being running, run through a gauntlet, right? Their commendation from Jesus would have been very sweet given what they had gone through. For us, we don't quite face the serious threats to our lives in the same way with our faith. We're running a marathon maybe in the middle of Saskatchewan with nowhere in sight. So just a question, right? Are you spiritually dry? Are you finding it hard to put one foot in front of the other? It's a different challenge than the Ephesian church faced, but the command is the same for them as it is for us. Patiently endure, keep running. As we see in Hebrews 12.1, and this has encouragement that I think it's good to see, let us run the endurance, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now back to the Ephesian church here. This commendation from Christ is real. It's credible. It's sincere. The church has endured. You know, sometimes I think we have these arguments where we're like, well, I really want to tell them that, so I'm going to butter them up and say something nice first. Um, he has a rebuke, but this is absolutely a heartfelt commendation. Um, however, just as this commendation was significant and genuine, the rebuke that's coming next is equally scathing. So we see this in verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And that brings us to our second point. It's the warning for this church. Repent of lovelessness. The Ephesian church had held fast to doctrine, and that was excellent and praiseworthy. It's a great quality. They exercised doctrinal discernment. They were firm in their convictions to the point of death. And yet Jesus has them against them. They're growing cold in their love. Do we ever so rigidly hold on to doctrine but fail in demonstrating love? Doctrine is not an end in and of itself. It is meant to be embodied. Because he first loved us, therefore we love. We have a real problem in our churches when those who are doctrinally sound fail to demonstrate love. Because the argument here is not to focus less on doctrine and just more on unity. Rather, the only consistent way to read this passage is that firm doctrinal convictions and genuine Christian love must go hand in hand. Now, if you've never heard of a cage stage Calvinist, sorry if I'm opening up a can of worms, I promise I'm actually saying something good about them, so hang with me. But we sometimes say this phrase, cage stage, right? explain what I'm saying if you're not familiar. When a believer first learns about the doctrines of grace, they're kind of rabid. Their minds are so blown and convicted by the truth, praise God, that part is commendable, but they can sometimes act a bit aggressive, maybe go online and, and pick a fight. And so the saying goes, we need to put them in a cage until they calm down a little bit. And I'm just going to clarify something, especially for you brothers and sisters who might be in that stage yourself. I mean, not polite for us to, to label that. But loving doctrine is good. We aren't asking you to love doctrine less. Love the scriptures. 
cling to them, read good books, listen to excellent teaching, and let all of it sink into your heart. Living out your doctrine leads out to love. If you aren't being loving enough, repent, go back to the doctrine, learn it again, let it reach your heart. I think about Jonathan Edwards, who is sort of a foremost intellect in the West. Um, he is the reason that we have resolved men's ministry, right? He wielded his resolutions. That's why we call it resolved men's ministry. I think if he sat in our pew, even the most doctrinally minded, he might think that we weren't doctrinally minded enough. And I think we might be shocked by the emotional output we would see in his life if we could just kind of transport him to us and the expectation he might see in our life for love. Now, of course, there are two ditches I want to avoid here. Emotionalism and intellectualism. Emotionalism, as Josh always says to us, is not flooring the car in neutral. You will have heard that if you've spent a few days with Josh. Like revving up the engine and going nowhere. But intellectualism is the other ditch. Cold, dead head knowledge rather than a passionate faith, an affected heart because of God's word and truth. We want to be in between emotionalism and intellectualism. I think the Ephesian church was showing that their doctrine wasn't reaching their hearts like it did before. It wasn't extending out in love. As you see in verse 4, you abandoned the love you had at first. We know there's a lot of Bible verses about what happens if we don't have love, right? We'll go to a few of those. So I'm going to read an Edwards quote here. We're going to put it on the screen. And I think it shows us what it might look like if your church is growing a little bit cold. So here we go. It's going to be two slides worth. I am bold in saying this. I think he realizes this is a little bit countercultural. But I believe that no one has ever changed either by doctrine, by hearing the word, or by the preaching and teaching of another, unless the affections were moved by these things. No one seeks salvation. No one ever cries for wisdom. No one ever wrestles with God. No one ever kneels in prayer or flees from sin with a heart that remains unaffected. In a word, there is never any great achievement by the things of religion without a heart deeply affected by those things. The reason is this. They are not affected with what they hear. There are many who hear about the power, the holiness, and the wisdom of God, about Christ and the great things he has done for them, and his gracious invitation to them, and yet they remain exactly as they are in life and practice." People are hearing the word of God all the time, and they're totally unmoved. Do you hear what Edwards is saying? He's suggesting that we're never changed by head knowledge only. One of my favorite pastors um, does this, so I'm kind of stealing it from him. But he went through this quote, and he says, it's not the knowledge of things that moves things. So it's not what's in your head that moves things, right? But it's knowledge that affects your heart that moves such things makes you wrestle with sin, makes you wrestle with God and flee from sin. So first of all, if you are new to your faith, we took a little shot at our cage stage friends here, right? Probably not a fair term. If you're new and your heart is massively affected, you're, you're not facing that problem, right? You're totally, you're totally affected by the power of God's work in your life. Praise God. I mean, grow in patience with yourself, grow in patience with others, grow in repentance and dependence on God, but praise God for the impact that has been evident through your transformed life and affected heart. Now, on the other end of the coin, for those of us who've maybe been a Christian for a long time, have our hearts grown cold? Where Christianity in Canada is kind of old hat, we've become a little bit civilized and sterilized. We should see verses 4 and 5 as a warning light. But I have this against you, that you abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If we are doctrinally solid, but the warning light in our car is going off for dwindling love, that's a big warning sign. A lack of love is a serious matter for a Christian. 
Jesus says so right here. You can be doctrinally discerning, enduring incredible persecution, and like Paul says, if you have not love, you're what? We can go to 1 Corinthians 13 too. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Are we getting fattened on the knowledge and our love is cold and disappearing? Hearing these words to the Ephesian, hear these words to the Ephesians church, and would basically would Christ say the same thing about our church or to you? Be on guard that we don't let our good focus on doctrine stop in the brain and fail to reach our heart. If we are loading up on doctrine and losing your love, Jesus has two words for you. Remember from where you have fallen and repent. This means confess your sin in small group. Pray 139 that God would show you any grievous way in your heart, right? Hopefully we're familiar with this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you have lost your love, repent. If you have something against your brother or your sister, go talk to them today. Like this is, this is practical, right? Make it right. If you aren't showing Christ-like love in your home, repent to your spouse and your kids personally. Love, love is not optional for a Christian. And if we're not sure how or where to repent, ask God to show you. Pray Psalm 139. Practice the habits of grace. Prayer, scripture reading, fellowship. Be with the people of God. Believe me, if you're in there, in the nitty gritty, with the people of God, there will be opportunities for your love to, be, to show up and to be worked on. So here's an important turning uh, of this repentance. An important tuning of this repentance. Repentance doesn't just mean mental assent. I mean, you don't need to just mentally assent. I, I, uh, sorry, you do need to mentally assent, have assent, even if you don't feel anything in your heart, right? We should repent out of obedience. But repenting also means to turn. We must turn from our evil ways. I mean, we don't want to hear this, but if we're repenting the same thing over and over again, and we're not really changing things in our lives, I mean, that's cheap grace, we don't want to think that our church is doing that. Look at Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Repentance is, of course, part of the recipe of the endurance in Hebrews 12, where we throw, throw it off. Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So here's the reason that this matters. Because if we look at the back half of verse 5, look at the consequence if we don't remember and we don't repent. Why am I harping on that, right? Why do we have to have love? Why do we need to repent? If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. You see repent twice there. This is a warning that if your love grows cold, your church could no longer exist. Christ could remove your lampstand and scatter you. So there's a real warning here. Repent of lovelessness. Now I love that we get this little commendation sandwich. This is unique to this letter versus the other six. Around the rebuke. Commendations before and after the rebuke. To remember, uh, to remember our love. In verse 6 we see that it still reminds us that we should absolutely still hate evil practices. So verse 6. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There isn't a ton of concrete knowledge about the Nicolaitans, but we have a reason to believe that they espoused false doctrine, encouraged sexual immorality, and the church of Ephesus did not put up with that. The most important phrase here is, which I also hate. Do you see the contrast? We ought to love what Jesus loves and hate what Jesus hates. Now let's go back to Psalm 139, because I think what's beautiful about this is we saw the search me and know my, my ways, right? 
We're going to go to the next slide, which shows from 21 down. So look at this. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So David is expressing this as well. He's saying he's in full alignment with God. He hates, with complete hatred, the enemies of God. And that hatred, that anger, has the boundary of his intimacy with God. Search me, O God, know my heart. See if there be any grievous way in me. Basically, show me if my anger or my hatred is not lining up with yours, that I might repent of it. We should hate evil and love those we encounter with the love that was first shown to us. So, the warning, repent of lovelessness. And finally, we're reaching our last verse here. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that brings us to our last point, the promise, the hope for paradise. So as we look to Jesus' closing remarks, he begins with a familiar phrase. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear. You actually see that he who has an ear, let him hear in the last verse of all the seven letters. There are people who will hear with their ears, but not with their hearts. And Jesus is reminding us, if you have ears to hear, Listen, it's an urgent call. Only the one who conquers will enter paradise. And the promise he offers is so sweet. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. So, what makes us conquerors? Is it our works? Is it our steadfastness in persecution? Is it our patient endurance? Is it our love? Did these things make us conquerors? Romans 8 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's the love of Christ that has made us conquerors. John puts it this way in 1 John 5, 4-5, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Doesn't that remind us of our time in the Gospel of John? <laughs> our conquering is obtained by faith in Christ through no work we do, but only through his finished work. When David was struck down Goliath, victory was secured, right? Before the Israelites even went down into battle, they were already conquerors. They still strapped on the armor. They still ran into battle. They still had to clash with the Philistines and drive them out of the land. But they had already won because their champion had won. The battle was already decided. That's where we live now. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We have our spiritual armor and our spiritual battles, and therefore we press on because we have assurance of the outcome. Our champion has already won, just as we saw in that story. And as conquerors, what privilege Christ grants us. What awaits us at the end of life is the reward we lost at the very beginning, the tree of life and fellowship with our God. In Genesis 2, we find a description of God creating Eden. He handcrafts a place of lush beauty for man to dwell. And the Lord God planted a garden of Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we get this promise about the tree of life in Revelation 2.7, right? We're going back to the garden, and I think we remember that story, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and, e and evil. That's a, a second tree, a forbidden tree, a story we're probably fairly familiar with. 
Adam and Eve disobeyed the specific command of the Lord not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, they were cast out of the garden. A little further ahead in Genesis 3, to 24, we see the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned away, turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God bars sinful humans from the tree of life. We were meant to dwell in a garden with the tr that tree in our midst, but because of sin, we are now separated from it. Now, thankfully, there's a third tree in the story, and that was a tree on Calvary, the old rugged cross, a better Adam, a perfect sacrifice, the ultimate act of love. He who has ears, let him hear. Christ died to save sinners. In God's mercy and patience, he holds his wrath and judgment back, but that doesn't last forever. There is a reckoning for all sin. If you are in Christ, that reckoning already happened. It happened on the tree of Calvary. Your champion has already won. Christ the conqueror has won the right for us to eat of the tree of life, otherwise barred by sin. That's why we see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 56. We sing this, right? Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the victory because we are given the victory. And here's the promise prized found at the very end of the story. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. We will get to dwell where God always intended his people to dwell, with him. We will get to taste the fruit of this tree we've waited for for so long. That sweet knowledge is meant to fuel our patient endurance. It's meant to fuel our love for doctrine. It's meant to power our love for one another in the church. Our hope is not a wish. It's a promise given by King Jesus himself to the one who conquers. That is to the one who is found in Christ at the last day. He will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So the whole book of Revelation is full of hope for the believer. Our king has conquered and will conquer. So we should remember the commendation to endure with patience, the warning to repent of lovelessness, and the promise, our hope for paradise. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that we can rest in your hope and the finished work of Christ. I pray, God, that we will be a church of loving endurance, running the race with gentleness, encouraging and building one another up. May we be a church able to speak the truth in love and to receive rebuke as it comes. We pray that everyone who has an ear will hear and will listen. We pray, God, that our heart will overflow with worship and love for our glorious King. Amen.